Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us both here in Washington and via C-SPAN, wherever you are. My name is Nathan Sachs, and I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Policy here at the Brookings Institution. And on behalf of the Center and the Brookings Institution at large, I want to welcome you again. We have a very special event today and a full house uh, to boot. This is not the first event in Washington on this general topic, and I think it's a fair question to ask why. Why are we focusing on the murder of one individual? And I think that's a topic that will come up in, in our uh, discussion today, of course. But I, I think two points are worth pointing out at first. I've said this, I think, perhaps even right here before, but Brookings has a quaint notion that facts matter. We still believe that. It's controversial, but we do. And we think also that norms perhaps might matter, or perhaps should matter. I think that's perhaps more open for debate on which norms and when. And in that sense, I could not think of a better event to uh, shed light on some of the facts of what became a very large and very important event. Jamal Khashoggi was known to many people in Washington. He was uh, in this building many times, and known to many people both here uh, and abroad. And his murder, in that sense, perhaps drew more attention than would others. That's, I think, fair to say. But his murder also had important implications for international law, for uh, international norms, and as a resident of the United States, for American foreign policy. And so with that, I, I'm delighted that we can host this event today. Uh, and on short notice, I'm, again, grateful for the, the full house. This event, of course, is, in, is particularly important because we have a very special guest, and we're honored uh, to have her here with us, Dr. Dr. Agnes Kalamald, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions. And um, thank you very much, Dr. Kalamald, for joining us. She, uh, a citizen of France, has a distinguished career in human rights and humanitarian work globally in civil organizations, the United Nations, and in academia. She is currently the director of the Columbia University Global Freedom of Expression, an initiative seeking to advance understanding of the international and national norms and institutions that define and protect freedom of expression and information in, in an interconnected global community. Uh, she also works as special advisor to the president of Columbia University, Lee Bollinger, and she previously had many years in very important civil society organizations dealing with civil rights and freedom of expression. She was the executive director of Article 19, an uh, international human rights organization promoting freedom of expression. She, was, uh, she found and led Humanitarian Accountability Partnership, now CHS Alliance, and she formerly worked in uh, Amnesty International as well in very important roles. Uh, in her role as Special Rapporteur, of course, she's had um, a very important role in understanding what has exactly happened on the events that we're discussing today. And we're delighted to have her, honored to have her, and look very much forward to her uh, comments. Uh, I'm also joined by two friends and colleagues, and I'll be brief with their uh, bio since you have them with us, with you. Uh, but moderating our discussion will be my friend and colleague Tamara Wittes, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Middle East Policy. She was formerly Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs at the State Department and the Obama Administration. She's done a lot of work on democracy promotion. She was Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in 2011, so you can imagine she had something to do there. She co-hosts Rational Security, which if you have not listened to yet, uh, shame on you. And uh, please listen to it. It's, worth, it's definitely worth your time. Uh, and she's also written on this topic exactly, on the question of U.S.-Saudi relations and U.S. relations with Middle East powers more broadly. And we're also joined a special treat by my former boss, uh, a non-resident senior fellow with us at, uh, and foreign policy program and formerly the uh, acting vice president of our program. Uh, he is now the um, chief engagement officer at World Justice Project here in Washington. From April 2008 to 19, he was a senior fellow here with us, as I mentioned, and he was also the inaugural fellow of our Robert Bosch Foundation, um, the Brookings Robert Bosch Foundation uh, Fellowship in Berlin. He previously, in the Clinton administration, worked uh, in the White House, the State, Mar State Department, and the Pentagon, and at Brookings worked on a wide variety of issues relating to human rights, diplomacy, and the rise of democracy. Uh, he is the author of Five Rising Democracies and the Fate of Int the International Liberal Order, which I highly rec recommend as well. And so without further ado, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Kalamar, Tamara Wittes, and Ted Picon to the stage, please.
good afternoon. Thank you very much for the kind words and the introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. Sorry. Um, and uh, to share with you very quickly some of the, the findings and conclusions related to my um, investigation. And then I hope we can have a, uh, a conversation. Um, you know, I, I, I think you have over the last week been bombarded with information about uh, the, the, the killing of Mr. Khashoggi's and, uh, and the inquiry I have, uh, I have pursued, but I felt it was uh, still important to highlight um, uh, a few uh, um, dimensions of it. So the, the, the killing of Mr. Khashoggi was both an extraordinary event and unfortunately a fairly common pattern. It's common because many journalists and human rights defenders around the world are the object of targeted killings, intentional uh, killings, and indeed there is uh, enough evidence to highlight the fact that those killings are not decreasing but, but are increasing in spite of many efforts to, um, to stop them. Um, and um, there is also uh, evidence that those killings are usually met with impunity. But it is also an extraordinary killing because of the, uh, the, the nature and the circumstances of, uh, of the execution of Mr. Khashoggi. It's an extraordinary brazen act, and it is an act of state. So my uh, investigation sought to determine uh, whether or not there were uh, states responsible for the killing, uh, which one were they, uh, and what were the implications of uh, the killings for uh, justice for Mr. Khashoggi and more generally for the prevention of violence against journalists around the world. As you know, the, um, uh, the state of Saudi Arabia has put forward the theory that the killing was um, um, conducted by rogue officials, it's a, uh, and uh, therefore that they had done everything that they had to do to respond to, um, to the killing. I took their theory uh, seriously and to heart. I looked at the evidence at my disposal in terms of the commission of the crime, in terms of the investigation of the crime, and in terms of the prosecution of the crime. And my only, the only conclusion I could reach on the basis of the evidence is that the state of Saudi Arabia is responsible for uh, the killing. Um, there is a great deal of international uh, standard and jurisprudence on what it means for a state to be responsible for a violation, including a killing. So I did not come up with my own theory in terms of distinguishing between a rogue act and a state act. I relied uh, extensively on what had been um, done and written, in, including by the International uh, Law Commission. And basically, the definition of a state act is really um, an act conducted by state officials using state means and resources. And the killing of Mr. Khashoggi met all of the characteristics of a state killing. It was done by uh, 15 representatives of the state, all of whom, with one exception, worked for the state uh, security uh, agencies. It was planned at least 48 hours and probably earlier than that. Uh, it was planned from uh, Riyadh. Um, the killing itself was premeditated at least 24 hours before uh, the killing, according to uh, various information I was able uh, to gather. The, uh, st the state representatives, the state agents that conducted uh, the execution, 15 of them, did that by using uh, means, uh, state means. They traveled, at least eight of them traveled using a private jet with diplomatic clearance. Uh, two of them used a diplomatic, um, a diplomatic passport. As you know, the killing took place in a consulate. The consul himself used the, his power to ensure that there were no witnesses on the floor where the killing took place. Um, after the killing, uh, someone had uh, planned 
to um, behave as if he was Mr. Khashoggi. That also required some planification, if only to have a fake beer. Um, so all of the uh, dimensions of the execution of the crime meet the definition of a state killing. State agent, state mean, state resources. There was nothing private. There was nothing personal about the execution of the crime. Um, so that's for the execution. In addition to that, I also looked at the investigation and the prosecution. Under international human rights law, the failure to investigate effectively, promptly, in good faith, there are a number of other standards, uh, uh, a killing amounts to a violation of the right to life. So I did consider the steps taken by Saudi Arabia to investigate uh, the killing of Mr. Khashoggi. I found out that they had a team of 17 people that arrived in Turkey. Um, well, the first bunch arrived on the 6th of October, and they remain in Turkey until uh, past the 15th. During that period, they were in the crime scene on their own, uh, without uh, any uh, witnesses and without the Turkish investigators. There is plenty of or enough evidence to conclude that while they may have investigated what happened there, they also took the opportunity of their presence in the crime scene to clean it, making it impossible for the Turkish investigators that were finally granted access on the 15th and on the 17th to gather any kind of material uh, evidence related to the killing. In addition to that, the Turkish investigators were only granted six hours in the crime scene itself, which was the, uh, the consulate, and a few more hours in the residence two days later. Uh, but they also had to, um, uh, to investigate all of the, um, uh, the, the, the cars. Um, so the investigation, in my uh, opinion, and based again on international standard related to what an investigation should look like, based on those standards, there is no way I can conclude that the investigation conducted by Saudi Arabia was done uh, uh, effectively, was done in good faith, and uh, allowed for international cooperation. That investigation could only have been, that type of investigation could only have been conducted given the level of interest and given the public statements that were made at the time. That investigation was done with the, uh, uh, the Saudi government uh, authority behind it. So there the link between the investigation and the state is direct uh, and is therefore reinforcing the notion that the, the execution uh, of the killing and what happened afterwards is a state act. And then when I looked at the prosecution of the, of the crime, so what I did find was also a range of um, weaknesses, limitations, and um, abuses as per international human rights law. Just to give you a few examples, um, the prosecutor identified in one of his statements a range of people responsible for the killing. He even named one of them as having incited uh, the team before it left, Saud al Katani, having told them, bring back Mr. Uh, Khashoggi, he's a national threat. That particular individual, in spite of the role that the prosecutor himself acknowledged, has not been charged. Uh, and is not part of the 11 people who are currently uh, on trial. As you know, the trial is held behind closed door, and the um, Saudi authorities are continuing to hide behind the charade that this is a domestic matter, even though everything about the killing of Mr. Khashoggi makes it an international crime. Um, the killing itself is a violation of international human rights law and of the use current norm. The circumstances of the killings mean that Saudi Arabia violated the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations and the UN Charter related to the prohibition on the uh, use of force extraterritorially at times of peace. The killing of Mr. Khashoggi also amounted to an act of torture, which is um, grounded on a, on a treaty 
city uh, and constituted an enforced disappearance, still constitute an enforced disappearance to the extent that the uh, remains of this body have not been located. Everything about um, the killing of Mr. Khashoggi makes it uh, an international crime which should attract international attention, scrutiny, and in my view, uh, which mandate indeed um, an international investigation and universal jurisdiction. Uh, so this, in a nutshell, are the findings of the, um, of the trial, of the um, uh, killing of Mr. Khashoggi, an international crime, a brazen act, a state crime for which the state is responsible. Once we have determined state responsibility, the next step should be, what does that mean? State is big. Who is, who is responsible for the killing? As I highlight in my report, uh, my inquiry is grounded on international human rights law, which means focusing quite largely on the responsibilities of the state. However, I did um, look at the evidence to determine what should be the logical next step. And the logical next step for me is to identify individual liability in relationship to the, to the killing, particularly within the chain of command. The 11 people on trial at the moment are really at the lowest level. Yes, they were, five of them at least were in the room at the time of the killing, so they are responsible for the killing. But the trial has failed and is failing so far to uh, tackle the chain of command, um, which in a very centralized state as that of uh, Saudi Arabia does require to look at a fairly high level, in my opinion. Uh, in the report, I highlight some of the evidence at my disposal which indicate that more work needs to be done to investigate the liability of the Crown Prince and you know, of his advisor, Saud al Katani. With the case of Saud al Katani, the prosecutor himself, as I have said, is, has already admitted of his responsibility uh, for the crime. Um, in that, in that case, at least for an enforced disappearance, which is also, as I said, a, a crime under international law and yet is not being charged. So there is much more that can be done uh, with regard to um, individual liability and a criminal process. I have concluded, however, that I, I am not convinced that judicial accountability will be easy to find. Um, particularly in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, I do not believe that this can be done very well out of Turkey either. I'm hoping that there will be some steps taken in the United States, which raise a range of difficulties in terms of asserting jurisdiction, even though I think the U.S. has a deep, deep interest in, uh, in the killing of Mr. Khashoggi and in truth-telling. Um, however, I will not want... The, the search for justice for Jamal Khashoggi to be held hostage of the vagaries of legal processes in Saudi Arabia. I think it is important to identify other uh, options for judicial accountability and prosecution, but as well for different forms of accountability, political, diplomatic, strategic, cultural, um, a, a number of them, and these have been the object of uh, the recommendations in my report, along with um, uh, some, some of the analysis. So uh, in, in conclusion, um, I, um, I think one uh, political issue that is very clear to me is that the uh, the response to the killing of Mr. Khashoggi cannot be to hide behind a process in Saudi Arabia that is so imperfect. Um, uh, that's the first thing. Second, we cannot hide behind the notion that it is a domestic issue in Saudi Arabia. Absolutely not. It is a crime that really calls on the international community to denounce but also act. Um, it is a crime for which the United States in particular should have um, a particular interest in solving and a particular interest in, uh, in the accountability process. And one of the reasons I'm coming to Washington um, is to hope to um, speak 
and uh, identify with various actors how far the United States can go, what it should do to ensure that the uh, killing of uh, Mr. Khashoggi, a U.S. Uh, resident, um, um, an employee, uh, a journalist for the Washington Post, therefore in many ways a symbol for a very deep-seated value uh, in, in the U.S., that that killing does not go unpunished. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, as you heard, I'm Tamara Wittes, Senior Fellow here in the Foreign Policy Program. Dr. Calamard, thank you so much for those uh, specific and comprehensive uh, opening remarks and for uh, the painstaking and thoughtful work that went into this report, um, which is generating, I think, conversation not only around the specifics of this case, but also, as you noted, what this case means for, uh, for state responsibility for human rights violations, the balance or the tension between individual accountability and state accountability, and what responsibility other actors in the international system have to ensure accountability. And importantly, as you said in your report, the responsibility to prevent a recurrence. Um, because as you noted at the outset of your remarks, uh, the targeting of journalists, the targeting of political dissidents uh, is all too common. Um, I have to begin by asking whether you've discussed your report and your recommendations with the Secretary General at all. No. I actually tried to, uh, he was in Geneva when I was there last week, but uh, protocol made it very difficult for he and I to have a conversation. I am planning to do so, however. Wonderful. And have you spoken with the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet? Yeah. Uh, and what, in that conversation, understanding that your role is under the UN Human Rights Council, a subject that I know we'll come to in this discussion, um, the High Commissioner, of course, also has an essential role to play. So what do you and she see as the next steps within the UN? She? You mean the High Commissioner? Yes. I think you will have to ask her, really. I, I will not want to put words in her, in her mouth. Uh, she did express the support for the findings and for the follow-up and for accountability. So, um, you know, yeah. Okay, thank you. Do you. So do you think you have allies within the UN system to pursue additional steps at the UN, which is, of course, one channel for pursuing international accountability? That's an interesting question, Ally. Mm. <laughs> Look, I think... Um, I think the UN until now has been um, paralyzed a bit in terms of how or a lot, in terms of how to tackle such, um, such an issue. I think it's um, uh, the Secretary General, the Security Council, uh, the Human Rights Council uh, have been, um, have found difficult. Uh, to tackle a crime that is um, linked to such influential actors mm -hmm. as Saudi Arabia, that is, uh, you know, has been at the, is actually right now, as I was presenting my report, there was um, those, you know, uh, words of war with, with Iran. I mean, it's all extraordinarily difficult. Uh, and I think that is not helping solving um, a truth and justice for um, the killing of Mr. Khashoggi. So I think there are allies within the member state. I think there are allies within um, uh, individuals working for the United Nations. I think when it comes to decision-making bodies, we'll have to keep pushing. 
Thank you. So I, I think as I reflect on the weeks and months since Jamal's murder, um, one of the features that has made it so tricky for investigators, uh, but for all of us to, to understand what happened and to understand the role played by different actors is the, the context of regional politics. This, this murder took place in the midst of uh, rivalries mm -hmm. and disagreements within the region, including between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. And so in the immediate aftermath yeah. of Jamal's disappearance, we saw uh, leaking to the media. We saw selective release of information, particularly by the Turkish government that may, you know, and, and there are those who would argue that that muddied the waters, including for an investigation like yours. Now, my understanding is that as you went about this work, you had some cooperation from both governments, both the Turkish and the Saudi government, or I'll let you describe uh, precisely, uh, but also that the Turks did not provide you with all of the audio tape that they had available. They didn't provide you with all the evidence mm -hmm. that they had available. Would you talk a little bit about how you navigated yeah. those relationships? Um, so the. Uh, investigation into the killing of Mr. Khashoggi was a complex one because of the political environment, because of the geostrategic uh, upheaval that were taking place as I was um, proceeding with my inquiry, but also because of the nature of the evidence that was available, all of which was very much based on intelligence rather than on what you would expect to find in terms of um, evidence. And intelligence is very distinct from, uh, from criminal evidence. It is, it's, uh, you know, it's like water. You, think, you seem to hold it and then it goes away. It's, it's, um, it's not as tangible uh, and it is very difficult to challenge it properly. So I'm, I am highlighting those limitations in my report. A great deal of the information available regarding the execution of the killing itself, those, those very important two days, are based on intelligence and on recordings, which I could not authenticate, meaning the Turkish government did not give me copies of the, um, and, and that's actually quite understandable because copies of such recording give you access to metadata, which allows you, if you're so inclined, to find really the sources and the methods. So that could not be done. So I was allowed to listen to the recording in the uh, Office of the Intelligence of Turkey, um, and but only so much of the recording. So what the rest of the recordings may say about the killing, whether they may not have anything to say about the, the killings, that of course are um, very important questions. I hope that the Turkish <coughs> investigators eventually will make those uh, remaining recordings public. Um, I was, I found different ways of, of finding, of triangulating the information provided in the recording, either through uh, CCTVs, for instance, and, and other forms of evidence I could gather, and uh, by talking to other experts who had listened to the recordings, and therefore I could get a sense from them of um, what, how they had interpreted the recording, because the recordings are not a straightforward. You need to interpret them. There are, you know, there are background sounds. There are a lot of things. So, uh, I think it's important to recognize that the killing of Mr. Khashoggi is complex um, from an evidentiary standpoint, uh, but not impossible. I did get a fair amount of. Um, uh, support from the Turkish authorities. They gave me access to more than just the recording, so I have also a uh, result from there when they eventually searched the, um, uh, the crime scenes. They did provide me access to what they found there um, and a range of other things. The Saudi uh, authority did not cooperate at all, so they did not respond to my various 
official letters. They did not respond to my request to meet with the Saudi investigator uh, and with the Saudi prosecutor. I just, you know, if um, there was no cooperation whatsoever. And have they communicated with you at all since the report was issued, other than the public statements we've seen? Uh, no. Uh, they have, um, well, they've done those public statements uh, um, critiquing what the work I had done, accusing it of biases and, and so on, but they remain very general. So they did not uh, suggest or they did not present a particular aspect of my conclusion that they felt was uh, unfounded. Uh, they remain at a very general level and usually use, you know, they, they use a script basically that all governments that do not like to be criticized by the UN uses. Or oh, she is biased, the methodology is flawed, and she uh, relied on the media. Basically, those are the three critics, and you found them every time a government doesn't like your work. That's what they did. Thank you. Um, Ted, I want to bring you into this conversation and, and, uh, and ask you to go a little bit to this issue of state responsibility as, a, as opposed to the responsibility of individuals. Um, and, you know, this is a bit of a tension in international human rights law. Um, we developed tools for individual accountability partly to ensure that individuals knew they would be culpable, they couldn't claim they were just following orders, and to create incentives for individuals to refuse orders to abuse rights. Mm. Um, but in this case, we see that this focus on individual accountability has maybe diverted our attention from state responsibility. I, I think um, what Dr. Kalamart, thank you, Tamara, and um, what Dr. Kalamart has done here, I think, in her report, which I've read the 101 pages, and I have to say, I've read a few of these reports in my research here at Brookings, and this is one of the most comprehensive and thoughtful and sober reports that I've ever read um, on such a difficult and complex subject. So I have no doubt that what you're hearing today, just the summary, is coming from something that's much deeper and richer in terms of its content. And I think that goes to the importance of the case. I mean, the, the state responsibility, and, and it being the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in particular, um, does raise a number of, of challenges. And I think the fact that Turkey is also involved only complicates matters. And the way that you drew on so many different aspects of international law, um, so it was the individual human right to life and to be free from torture, and not to be disappeared of Jamal Khashoggi, number one, but all the other violations that took place uh, by the state uh, in terms of the Vienna Convention on Consular Affairs and the extraterritorial use of force um, really call for a, you know, extraordinary treatment of this kind of, of a case. Um, Natan had mentioned a book that I worked on while I was here, but before that, I worked on another book in which I spent some years just investigating how UN special rapporteurs work and how they have impact at the national level. And so I'm coming at this from some time really looking in the weeds uh, of this. And so I want to mention a couple of things about this mechanism and put it in the context um, that's important. This mandate on uh, Special Rapporteur for Extrajudicial Executions was created in 1982. Um, so this is a standing uh, mandate that the member states of the Human Rights Council have created because they know that they need an independent voice to be their eyes and ears when it comes to these kinds of violations. And there are many, many other mandates that uh, they've created. Um, you know, it's fashionable in, in some circles in Washington to dismiss the Human Rights Council um, and its tools. They say it's useless, it's a shield for dictators, it's anti-Israel, but your investigation, I think, proves that all three categories are wrong. Um, this is a case involving a powerful Middle Eastern state um, and that goes to the heart of what is useful about the system. No one else in the UN system stood up to fill this vacuum of uh, not investigating a, an international crime. And I think that's where the special rapporteurs have the independence 
uh, to step in and do this. Uh, they have the mandate of the council, then they independently choose which cases to focus on, which countries, which priorities, and they, with, by the way, not a whole lot of resources. It's a very cost-effective instrument, and I'm sure she it's has It's not even stories. your day job. Um, exactly. <laughs> it's a very demanding job, and this one in particular, I could say, uh, has been done very, very professionally. Um, so I want to follow up on this question of other forms of accountability. You made the point in your remor remarks, Dr. Calamar, that we shouldn't focus only on the judicial mechanism. Um, and when it comes to the United States, I have to say I'm really struck by the contrast in the response between, uh, and not only the United States, but other countries mm. as well, the response to this murder mm. and the response to the Skirpal poisoning, mm -hmm. which also used, mm -hmm. you know, it was a state yeah. going mm -hmm. abroad, using diplomatic resources to target a dissident on the soil of another country who was there, you know, under that country's protection. Um, and in that case, the United States and a dozen or so other countries expelled Russian diplomats mm -hmm. and said, if you are going to violate the Vienna Convention on Consular Affairs in this manner, we're going to constrain your ability to exercise uh, your authorities under that convention. So uh, how are we to understand, I mean, is there something about this case that makes it particularly different from the perspective of a state party, or is it a difference between, is it a simple difference between the relationship between the U.S. and Russia and the U.S. and Saudi Arabia? Ted, maybe I'll, I'll let you start. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a more difficult question for you to answer. I mean, I think there, the human rights agenda at the international level has always been very politicized and a matter of power politics. And I think you can easily uh, see it through that lens in this particular case. Uh, I don't think that's a surprise. Um, I think that does make the work of a special rapporteur more challenging, but not impossible. And I think it is a matter of finding allies in the UN membership that will now take the case forward. Um, if you think about the Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in North Korea, uh, that broke new ground by bringing that case, it was a mandate of the Human Rights Council, all the way to the Security Council, and even the Chinese did not step in the way of making sure that human rights was put on the agenda of the UN Security Council as a matter of international security and peace. So the precedent has been set. And I think you do have to ask yourself whether this is another case that because of its scope and the you know, exceptional nature of it, it needs to be brought to a higher level in the UN system. As difficult as it can be, but it can be done. Mm. And if I may, if I may add, um, so the killing occurred in October second, and since then many governments, lead with uh, Saudi Arabia at the at the head, have attempted to bury it or to say let's move on. Uh, in fact, in January, I think at the um, at the economic Davos meeting, uh, Saudi Arabia was welcomed back in. Uh, quotation mark in, 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 the, uh, in the meeting and uh, let's, you know, with uh, the notion that now we can move on. That killing is not going to disappear. You know, my report came now. There will be more things coming up afterwards. So the, the idea on the part of various uh, representative of governments that eventually we can just, uh, you know, if we, if we hold on long enough, it will go away. I doubt it's going to happen. With this particular issue, it's not going to happen. There are journalists are after it, movie makers are after it, the fiancé of Mr. Khashoggi is not going to give up, I'm not going to give up, other investigators, Turkey. I mean, it's just not going to go away. So that's the first thing. The second thing I've, I, I, um, I want to highlight is that in my opinion, the killing of Mr. Khashoggi and more generally violations by Saudi Arabia are dangerous, of course, for, for the victims, um, but they also highlight very sharply the democratic deficit within our own uh, countries. There is a huge gap between um, what the public in general is asking and what 
the, the elected representatives are ready to do on that particular country. There is um, a very big gap, which is acknowledged by some uh, state representatives, but, but not by everybody. And, and therefore, um, finding ways of uh, you know, reducing that gap, I think, is particularly important for, for us here in this room and, and, and abroad. It is really a matter of um, the, the values of democracy and how to ensure that because a state is so powerful, uh, it can claim impunity for such an international crime. I think this is really, it really matters that we don't allow that message to become normalized. It was not normalized for Russia. It has not been normalized for Russia. It should not be normalized for Saudi Arabia. Whatever idiosyncrasies have been tolerated in the past when it comes to that particular country, I think it is really up to um, us, I think, um, the uh, electorate um, to ensure that the that our elected representative do stick to the to the script for uh, global governance and you know minimum respect for human rights and and we cannot tolerate that democratic deficit to become the norm. Thank you, Ted. Did yeah, you I'd love to that? jump in and build on this point, which is critical. Um, and the issue of accountability and opposite being impunity, I think, is really the heart of the matter here. And I like the way your report reflected on this. You said clearly that it's not just a matter of who ordered it, mm -hmm. who, who, who did the act, mm -hmm. but who was uh, in the chain of command and who failed to act, that being one step, but also not just criminal accountability, but we have to look at political and financial and diplomatic forms of accountability in order to make sure this case does not go unpunished given the facts of what we what we know. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on what some of those measures could could be um, and which ones you see as, as most feasible. Yes, so um, I, I really think that the narrative around the killing cannot be a narrative of defeat. Um, to me, that's extremely important, particularly in those days and age. Uh, and it is not a narrative of defeat. Yes, some individuals have not been held to account, or many others, but the issue is still on the global agenda. It keeps bothering uh, business as usual, and it keeps bothering some of the people holding power, and I'm not only talking about uh, the White House here, but in other countries, who would want to to you know move on? So we need to really um, ensure that the, the the notion of justice and accountability takes many different forms and many different colors. Um, political accountability, diplomatic accountability. You mentioned, for instance, the fact that after. Um, after the Russian um, dissident was killed using chemical means in the UK, there was a big diplomatic response. We have not seen that yet when it comes to Mr. Khashoggi. What we have seen are individualized targeted sanctions. There has not been um, a, a determination to hold the state of, account of Saudi Arabia to account. And to me, this is something we must absolutely insist upon. This is not only about individuals, it's about a state that has committed the state crimes. And so far, the Western government that have adopted individualized targeted sanctions, which by the way are good, um, are also selling the rogue theory by so doing. So it's really important to insist on what do we do vis-a-vis -vis the state of Saudi Arabia, not some you know, 15, 17 uh, individuals. That has not been done. I'm not necessarily calling for state sanctions except on one issue, which is surveillance technology. I didn't feel it was my 
to be honest, it was my mandate. And uh, these are difficult topics. State mm -hmm. sanctions are very, um, you know, can have very detrimental impact on, 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 on the little people of the country. So, but when it comes to, for instance, surveillance technology, that I believe there should be a moratorium on the sale of um, surveillance technology to Saudi Arabia because time and time again, that country has demonstrated that it can't meet, cannot be trusted in terms of how it's using um, that particular um, technology. So that's just uh, one example. You know, I, I have been, um, uh, I've now realized that next year the G20 will be taking place in Saudi Arabia. Mm. A political accountability for Mr. Khashoggi will mean that it doesn't happen or it moves elsewhere, or something is being done to ensure that the political uh, system uh, in the US and in other countries does not become complicit of, uh, of that international crime and of the narrative that Saudi Arabia is trying to sell fairly effectively in some quarters that it has taken the right steps to respond to it. Thank you. And I, I want to emphasize here a point that is brought out in your report very well, I think, which is that Jamal's murder took place in a context mm. of Saudi policy, yeah. uh, of other governmental abuses of human rights inside the kingdom. Um, and that when one thinks about prevention, um, whether it's the Saudi government's uh, responsibility to prevent the murder of someone like Jamal Khashoggi, but also the international community's intense interest in preventing a recurrence of such events, um, that there's a relevance. What else a government is doing? So as we sit here, uh, the trial of, of the women activists mm -hmm. who were arrested for peaceful advocacy is ongoing in the kingdom, right? Um, there are a number of others imprisoned for peaceful political dissent. Uh, and as you noted in the case of the trial of those accused of Jamal's murder, the, uh, the Saudi judicial system is not meeting basic standards of fairness uh, for the rights of those accused. So, um, so it strikes me that in addition to the point you made about democratic values, about freedom of expression, uh, and the responsibility and interest that, um, that other state governments have there, there is also a broader interest or an interest in looking more broadly at human rights and at this particularly brutal, particularly public extrajudicial killing in the context of the broader human rights behavior mm. of a government. Um, as we talk about accountability, and you mentioned the G20 uh, as one example of an opportunity, let's say, mm -hmm. for international accountability, it also strikes me that part of what has happened here in Washington, if we can be Beltway-centric for a moment, is that this is a very important relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia, but it is one between two countries with very different systems, very different values. Um, and Part of what I have observed in the concerns raised by American elected officials um, on Capitol Hill, for example, in the wake of Jamal's murder, is what does this say to us about the reliability of our partner? Mm -hmm. What does it say to us about our ability to work with this partner at a government to government level? Um, and, and so, it strikes me that there is an interest for Saudi Arabia in understanding the cost of this act and the cost of a failure to take responsibility for this act in terms of its ability to sustain its other international relationships, even if they're on entirely different issues. Um, I, I wonder, Ted or Dr. Kalmar, if you want I mean, to reflect I, on I, I, what, what comes to mind in your, your point here is the re-examination that's underway here in Washington about our relationship with China. Now, it's not at the same level of 
friendship in the first place, but very comprehensive. After many years of building up all kinds of dialogue and cooperation, we are going through a retrenchment. And I've looked closely at China's role. You talk about how systems are so different. Here is a system that's so different from ours. Do we share values on human rights? Well, if you look specifically at China's behavior at the Human Rights Council, you will see that there's been a, a bit of a sea change where they've gone from playing defense to offense. And I don't know if you've seen this in your time there, but we have seen that the Chinese are pushing against the whole way that the human rights system works. The ability of special rapporteurs to visit countries and do independent investigations is under attack, and China is leading the attack. Saudi Arabia's already been there for a long time. Are these our friends? Are these our allies? I mean, I think we have to be much more, much smarter about how we condition our relationships. And if we're serious about human rights, we have to put it higher on the level of priority. Do you think it makes a difference to the U.S. response to this murder that the United States is not itself engaged anymore at the Human Rights Council? It's not part of these conversations. <laughs> you know, I, um, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, there is a lack of leadership at the moment at the Human Rights Council, and for a while, the U.S. was quite um, an important actor and did lead on a number of very difficult issues within, uh, within the Human Rights Council under uh, President Obama in particular. Um, so there is a gap. There is a lack of leadership. There is um, people are waiting as they are all looking at each other over the Khashoggi um, investigation. I mean, I could feel it during what we call the interactive dialogue. After I presented my report, there is two or three hours where all the states make their uh, their statement, two minutes each. Um, and I was told before the day before that everyone was waiting to see what the others was going to do in order to determine how far they can go in their statement. So that's, um, there is no leadership at the moment. People are just not sure what, uh, what they can do. My, my reading of the interactive dialogue, um, and I don't know if you listened to it, Ted, maybe the time was not very good for the US. But it was really interesting to see how little support there were for uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, maybe up to eight countries made public statements uh, voicing their uh, critique and rejection of the report and their support for Saudi Arabia's ongoing process. I'll say, you know, probably eight. Uh, then there were a number of countries that were middle of the road, uh, but th even those countries, you would have expected them to actually be more supportive of Saudi Arabia. And I I'm not going to name any countries, but I'll invite you to uh, consult the statements. Um, and then there was quite a lot of countries, the majority, that voiced their support for the report and for some of the follow-up. Um, including countries that you would not have necessarily expected. So when it came to the Human Rights Council, I think the, th there was something happened there, which I cannot quite yet fully analyze, which I'm sure others will in the near, uh, in the near future. Now, when I say support for the report, it does not mean necessarily a bold statement um, <laughs> and a bold step towards um, holding um, Saudi Arabia and is, its leaders accountable. No, it was a little bit, it was public support, but yet not quite to the point where you would, you I would have liked them to be. But, um, so it was not a sea change, but it was certainly a, a very positive step taken by the vast majority of people who took a stand. Uh, and I think, based on my conversation with some of the countries that I, I thought would support Saudi Arabia and did not, I, knew, I know that they were criticized by Saudi Arabia afterwards. 
uh, but yet they took a principled stand. Uh, so something happened during that session, which is worth, if there is anyone interested in analyzing those dynamics, I think it's really worth looking at it and trying to understand the kind of reconfiguration that has happened. Uh, and that um, I hope that uh, the US Congress and Senate that have been quite uh, courageous in uh, challenging uh, the White House and in um, sticking really or, or trying to uh, ensure that those key principles, human rights protections, uh, uh, war crimes and so on are drivers for foreign policy. I think those uh, individuals and Senate in the Senate and the Congress should take some, um, I mean, uh, not pleasure, but uh, encouragement. encouragement. Mm -hmm. real encouragement from what happened at the Human Rights Council. Thank you. I'm going to open it up for questions from the floor at this point. Um, we have about 15 minutes. I'm going to try and get to as many of you as I can. I'm going to ask you to wait for the microphone, identify yourself, and ask one single concise question. And let's start with Shane Harris right in the middle here. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Shane Harris. I'm a reporter with The Washington Post. I was part of a team that investigated Jamal's murder, and thank you very much for the work that you've done uh, and for being here to discuss it today. Uh, I'm curious, since he was killed, we've seen a number of reports from other Saudi activists living overseas, mm -hmm. citing what they believe are credible threats to themselves that have been delivered in some cases by state intelligence services and security services. Nothing necessarily to indicate the level of threat that we saw against Jamal, but nevertheless concerning. Did you find anything in your investigations about other threats to activists and journalists, Saudis living overseas? And do you think it's possible, given the relative lack of consequence or response to the Saudi government for this crime, uh, that they could perpetrate something like this again against other activists? Thank you. Do you want to take? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, I in I I did. Uh, investigate that particular issue quite quite a lot uh, because I wanted to see whether the killing of Mr. Khashoggi fitted within a pattern by Saudi Arabia itself. So um, I could not find more than what was already in the public domain really, which is uh, there had been a, a, a few killings uh, and a number of uh, enforced disappearance and abduction. Um, when it comes to threats, I think um, there is absolutely no doubt, based on my interviews, that most Saudis living abroad who have, are either in exile or self-imposed exile uh, feel not, I mean, feel that there are risk attached to their life and to their well-being, I will say, certainly to their well-being. Uh, whether or not these have been more uh, specific than you know, a few phone calls and so on, possibly not at this stage, with the exception of the one that you have spoken about and others, which are the four activists that were worn by the CIA um, back in May. So, um, but uh, there is enough evidence, I think, to call for uh, a moratorium for, for the, uh, for the uh, surveillance technology uh, at the moment, for sure. Thank you. Here, please, in the front, Isra, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Carl Golovin. Uh, history is filled with examples of state-sponsored covert actions, assassinations, people being suicided or false flag terrorism. Does the United Nations investigate um, or what international law would be applicable to preventing states from engaging in covert actions that would be more subtle than what was done to Khashoggi, of course? Uh, and as references, uh, uh, the domain uh, lc4911.org and a very recent book, The Assassination of James Forrestal by David Martin. So ultimately the question is, what prevents states from simply doing things just more covertly? 
Yeah, in a way, it was the brazenness of this crime that attracted attention and, mm -hmm. and created the support that enabled you to do this yeah. investigation. So I haven't uh, elaborated on other forms of covert actions. In any case, I was m mostly focusing on killings. Um, and I did find um, over the last uh, five years about 15 such killings by that could be attributed to state, but as I didn't investigate them, I could not really um, uh, talk about them. So, um, yes, so covert actions do, of course, happen. Yes, they are in violation of international law, of a variety of, um, of international, um, uh, not only human rights law, but, but others. Does the UN investigate them? I think the UN has denounced them on a number of occasions. Um, they have denounced, and the Security Council has taken a position against uh, a killing, extrajudicial killing of a Palestinian activist in uh, Tunisia, which was one of the, the only time the Security Council took a position for one single killing. But the, Uni but the United Nations has denounced other killings, although not to the level of the, of the Security Council. There is also plenty of evidence of the police in a number of states having taken action to protect um, dissidents living in exiles, including Turkish dissident, Iranian dissident, uh, you know, uh, Saudi dissident, and, and so on. So I'm not sure I'm answering your, your question, but if you're asking whether it violates international law, yes, it does. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it can only be justified under two, uh, you know, with state consent. Well, I'm not talking about necessarily killing, but uh, st uh, state cons consent and a Security Council uh, authorization. authorization. So, yeah. Thank you. On the aisle here in the white shirt, Kevin. Uh, hello, my name is Sharon Kotak. And I'm wondering, have you met with any representatives of the Trump administration, either at the White House, the State Department, or the National Security Council? And, and if so, what were their reactions to your, your report? Thank you. Not yet. You haven't had meetings yet? No. I mean, I met with the US administration, but not anyone at the White House. Yet. Thank you. Mm. Yet. Mm. Emphasis on the yet. Marvin. Uh, Marvin Kalb, I'm a senior fellow here at Brookings. First, congratulations on the report. My question concerns the role of individuals rather than states. Mm. And you have been very careful today and in other public comments that you've made about not speaking about the role of the Crown Prince. Could you please do that now? <laughs> Um, you know, I haven't because it's not my area of expertise and it's not my mandate, you know. So I'm, I'm a human rights expert. I'm not an expert in criminal law, which is what would be uh, required. What did I find and which I have highlighted in the report? Um, I found that it is difficult to imagine uh, that the crown prince or someone really at, at that level didn't know or should not have known that there was such an operation. It, it is just, um, you know, it's it, it just difficult. Now, that does not mean that um, I have evidence of the Crown Prince ordering the killing, but I think it's important to understand that a criminal investigation should not just determine, as important as it is, who has ordered directly, but uh, high-level officials can be held accountable for other forms of action or inaction, inaction, for other commission or omission. And to me, that as it is quite important that we do not uh, narrow down the story about the killing of Mr. Khashoggi to who has ordered, because it could be who has incited, for instance, directly or indirectly, who knew that something was going on but failed to take action to stop it, 
who should have known that something was in planification and stopped and failed to prevent it. In the case of the, um, of the Crown Prince, two direct, two direct links to him are established in my report. First, as you pointed out, there was a campaign of uh, actions, of uh, violations taking place before the killing of Mr. Khashoggi. And there is no way you can suggest that he is not linked to that campaign. He's the head of state. Those violations have been uh, well uh, denounced and demonstrated. They have not even denied it so far. So his responsibilities for creating the conditions that made the killing of Mr. Khashoggi possible, I think is something that must be more thoroughly investigated than I have done, but is certainly one, uh, one possible direction. The second is the investigation. There is no way that the, the Crown Prince and others at his level did not know about the botched investigation. That, and that botched investigation, followed by a very uh, unsatisfying uh, prosecution, are a violation of the right to life. In, you know, almost at the same level as the commission of the crime itself. So that's also another direct link with the highest level of authorities, including um, the Crown Prince. But I, you know, I didn't want the, um, I, I didn't want the report to just focus on the Crown Prince. And I, I, I am, I'm hoping that the, the, the rea in fact, your reactions and your reaction show that what I'm trying to do is point the, the focus on the state, not on an individual at the moment. I think we really must insist that this was a state killings and for which the state must be held accountable and responsible. And if I might add, the steps you suggest for systemic reform <clears throat> within yeah. the state. Yeah. Everything from reforming of the intelligence services to release of political uh, prisoners and a whole set of other steps that if the kingdom was serious about trying to make amends for this crime, they could do a lot to start improving their human rights record. And I think that is what we're talking about. That's the opportunity. Sadly, tragically, we're at that point that this uh, moment offers. Yeah, you know, I, I recall when the abuses at Abu Ghraib took mm -hmm. place. Um, President George W. Bush came out in public and acknowledged responsibility on behalf of the United States government uh, and expressed his apologies publicly. Which the kingdom has not done. Right. So there are many ways for a state to take responsibility. Mm. Uh, on the aisle, Navy jacket. Just wait for the microphone if you would. Uh, Shana Steele and I24 News. The State Department says they have seen a copy of your report and that they're looking at it closely. What do you want the State Department to do? What do you want the administration to do? The, the US? What to, yes, the U.S. State mm -hmm. Department. Um, so in, in the report, I make a number of recommendations for, um, for specifically uh, at the, uh, directed at the United States. The first one, I think the U.S. can play a very import important role uh, in terms of truth-telling and um, uh, unlocking the secrecy that has been attached to the killing. There is so much linked to uh, intelligence sources and so on. It's extremely um, detrimental to the search for justice. I recognize the importance of not burning sources and methodology, but I think there is more than, um, than has been done so far, including by um, the CIA. So I'm recommending, most of my recommendations are really about uh, transparency and truth telling. It's about an FBI investigation uh, and declassification of the um, uh, of the information related to the killing of Mr. Khashoggi so that it can be made publicly, it can be made uh, held accountable. It could be a hearing within the Congress about the killing of Mr. Khashoggi. Anything, um, you know, 
all of those recommendations are really about unlocking the information that is in this country at, at present and that is being held under um, lock key um, or under the threats of legal actions for violating uh, very important national security provisions. That needs to be unlocked. That's what I'm, I'm recommending here. And then the other recommendations are with uh, the same as other member states, and I've already talked about looking beyond individualized sanction, sanctioning the crown prince at the moment, because there is enough evidence to suggest that he has a part of responsibility for the killing not necessarily ordering, but other responsibilities, and that I want to put the onus on them to demonstrate that he's not responsible. You know, if we cannot get access to all the evidence, let them show that he had nothing to do with it beyond, uh, you know, s some declarations. So I'm calling on, on sanction there, which I think are reflected actually in one of the uh, initiative within the Congress at the moment. Um, so that's what, there are a number of recommendations that are for all member states, but for the US in particular, it's about truth-telling, transparency, and unlocking the information that um, a few individuals want to keep um, under the cover. Dr. Calamard, I, I want to thank you. I know your time is short because you have other engagements today that I hope will prove constructive uh, and productive, but uh, as Natan said at the beginning, um, at Brookings, we believe that facts matter, and it's clear that accountability begins with truth-telling. And I want to thank you for the care and uh, the work that you put into telling the truth of what happened to Jamal, and, uh, and uh, we wish you the best thank in you your efforts much. at accountability. And thank you. Thank you. If I may just add one word, I, I, I do believe that it is um, the people in this room, or many of you at least, and, and others that would create the declic for, for real justice. Because through my many meetings with um, head of um, state or, or very high level representative, they really are very hesitant. And we need to push them to make the to take the right step to make the right decisions and to say you know that just cannot go on in that fashion that crime i know there are many other crimes around the world and i think what what the crime of mr kashogi has shown is the um the feeling of power and impunity that some countries exhibit uh, and that needs to be crushed that cannot be allowed. The narrative cannot be allowed to go on uh, without any reaction, and there has been plenty, but we must continue because that's very dangerous for Mr. Khashoggi's accountability, but more generally. It is intolerable that governments could just use their power to justify their own impunity. Because they are powerful, they must be held to account at a very high level. And that needs to be the message. And it, it's us who are going to bring that message home. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.